Examine the diagram in the middle of the page. Ask yourself, how are energy and nutrients being transferred or in how are they being stored? Can you even name these processes? The questions you're considering are related to ecology. This is the study of the interactions between organisms and the environment they live in. And as you can imagine, this is a rather uh, dynamic or changing process which makes it very complex. So how do we study such a complex system? The first is observations, much like you're doing now. The second would be experimentation. But question yourself, how can you control all the variables in an entire forest? Some, ex some experiments are impractical or even impossible. For example, we could ask, how many nuclear bombs does it take to blow up the world? We very well may be able to do this experiment, but who's going to take the data? So instead, the third option would be something like system modeling, making a smaller model of something so that you don't risk the consequences of, of the catastrophic event should it actually go that way. This might be in the form of just a smaller model or even a computer model. But to understand ecology, you need to recognize it comes in various levels. The smallest level of ecology is related to the individual. What is this individual moose impact on the environment? Or we could go larger. What's the impact of the population of moose? All the organisms of the same species in the same environment. Or we could look at how is this population combining with other populations to form the entire community in this ecosystem. All these things represent the biotic portion or the living portion of the environment. And that's what we've been focused on up until this point until we come now to the ecosystem level. And the ecosystem level contributes the abiotic factors. These are factors that are not alive but still important for the environment. Things like air quality, water quality, how often does it rain, what's the sunlight light, light like, how about the soil quality. All of these things represent the abiotic factors in an ecosystem. And so the ecosystem combines what's going on with the living and the non-living combined. We can then look at the ecosystem and, and compare it with other ecosystems that have similar geographic uh, similarities like temperature and precipitation. We refer to those as biomes. Biomes then throughout the entire world combine to make the biosphere. So let's look at energy. How is energy processed through the ecosystem? We can remember that energy is defined as the ability to do, to do work and it's measured in kilocalories. Over here we're going to look at these two diagrams which will emphasize uh, what we're interested in. First let's look at the leaf. We've got sunlight which is abiotic energy that's being converted into carbohydrates. In this case we can consider that biological forms of energy. The process that controls that is called photosynthesis. And a similar process though far lesser known is one called chemosynthesis where now chemical forms of energy mainly hydrogen sulfide are being converted into carbohydrates uh, and producing then biological energy. So we're going to refer to these organisms as autotrophs, those that produce their own biological forms of energy. Another name you can hear of them called is a producer. And these are fundamentally different than everything else over here. You're probably familiar with an herbivore, omnivores, carnivores, and even decomposers. Autotrophs produce their own energy, whereas the others are referred to as heterotrophs. They get their energy from elsewhere. So if we track the energy backwards, we can see that the energy ultimately comes from a producer. We often refer to this idea of energy moving in a one-way system as a food chain. And do notice the energy at no point goes back to a producer. But food chains rarely represent the complexity of what's happening in actual ecosystems. In fact, it probably looks a whole lot more like this. And so we can describe this better instead as a food web. And there are lots of different components we can focus on, but simply recognize that each level, we're going to refer to as a trophic level now, each level then passes energy on to the next. 
And we don't really need to keep track of who's an herbivore, omnivore, or carnivore, though that would be that could be helpful and useful. We're going to keep track of who is consumed first, second, and third, or rather who's doing the consuming. So make sure you can compare and contrast the different ideas related to a food chain versus a food web. To emphasize this point, let's examine one simple example. Here we have a caterpillar and it has a heterotroph, and it's feeding on uh, these plants. So this is an autotroph, and the, the caterpillar is the first consumer. And if it consumes 100 kilocalories worth of plant material, we can see that 50 of those kilocalories end up as waste. For whatever reason, the chemical bonds were undigestible. Those wastes are eliminated, and then they decompose. 35 of the original 100 calories may be actually used for the energy metabolism needs for the caterpillar itself. And then finally, 15 calories, the remaining 15, are probably used for growth. Those are excess calories that the, the caterpillar can use for its own growth and development. To say it slightly differently, here we see what was referred to as the energy pyramid. We've got energy coming in from the system, abiotic energy, again light or chemical energy that gets converted into biological energy by photosynthesis or chemosynthesis. The organisms that do this we refer to as a producer. So the producer brings in 100 percent of all the biological energy available. When a producer is consumed by a first level consumer, then only 10 percent of that energy on average is passed to the second trophic level. Which is different than we said over here. Here we had 15 percent but on average it is understood to be 10 percent to the first consumer. What happened to the 90 percent? Well that was eliminated as heat. Whether that's heat from decomposition of waste products as we saw here or energy that was used by the caterpillar and lost in the form of, of body heat. What if that first consumer then gets eaten by yet a higher level trophic consumer, a second consumer? We see only 10% of that energy that was at uh, the first consumer is now passed on. So we see this progression of losing 90% each time energy is transferred to a new trophic level. Again, where's that energy going? It's being lost in the form of heat back as abiotic energy. We can see the same pattern then, or the consequences of this energy pyramid, in the pyramid of numbers and the pyramid of biomass. In the pyramid of numbers, we can look at uh, an entire ecosystem and just count how many individuals are producers versus first, second, or third order consumers. And we can see the vast majority are producers, and less as we move on in the food web. Why are there far fewer consumers than producers? The answer is simple. There's far less energy to support them. What about biomass? The total amount of mass that the ecosystem can, uh, has at each level. The producers have far more total mass than all the other consumers combined. Why? Because there's less energy to support more bodies higher up in the food web. So, consider the following reflection question first. Use the picture from the very beginning of your notes, the picture of the owl and the mouse and the berry, etc. Draw the various components of the food web and assign them accordingly as autotrophs and heterotrophs, carnivores, herbivores, etc. Secondly, if we were to consider the energy pyramid, which would be the most efficient use of energy in an ecosystem? Consuming as an entirely plant-based vegetarian diet, or having a diet that includes meat and animal products. Be sure to explain your answer.